Hello, everybody. I uh, hope you can hear me well. I got my lapel mic on again today, and I've turned off all the uh, extraneous machinery. I am going to do uh, hopefully about a maybe seven to ten minute introduction to what we call fingerprinted barcoding. To be honest, this is a massive, massive topic, and I'm going to try in about seven minutes to basically compress four years of intense study and uh, a lifetime of, you know, sort of sort of general education uh, into like seven minutes. So this is going to be a bit of a challenge. Um, if you're interested on, uh, I think, Monday night, your guys' time, 9 p.m., there will be a Michael Geeky podcast where we're going to go into probably one of these topics in much more detail in a section I think he's calling Deep Science. Um, so I, uh, I kind of wanted to get a head start on that because, like I said, this is an enormous topic and I see a variety of questions. And I, I honestly don't know where to start. So this is kind of like maybe a primer, not necessarily for the whole topic, but just to get you started. Uh, and maybe, you know, out there on Google or whatever, doing some searches. Uh, the literature gets really, really deep. And that's why I, I, I pulled out this quite, <laughs> believe it or not, simple diagram. Uh, off, I don't even know. I've got probably five or six printed out here, but this was just the one that was on top. So I started writing on it. And I want to explain this real briefly. Again, I cannot get into a lot of detail right now, but... What I want to talk about is fingerprinting. We call it fingerprinting because like a human finger, uh, it's unique to hopefully um, a, an individual or closer related individuals in a population. That's where we get into problems immediately because what is a population? What is an individual? What is a clone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when we use what you probably are familiar with already is what's called the ITS region. This is commonly used for species level identifications. Uh, when we get to this level of DNA sequence, which is a whole other topic in, in and of itself, um, we start talking about acronyms like ITS and SSU and LSU and 5.8S and EF1 and out. Uh, it gets really like uh, terminology gets pretty, pretty and dense pretty quick. Anyway, for right now, let's talk about the ITS region. So the two things that you are, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm standing behind a Xerox box and I kind of knew that was going to happen. Um, I can't really do, I, I'm going to do another one maybe out on a proper board later, but um, I'm just kind of working in the lab here and there's a bunch of people outside. So anyway, there you go. I also don't have a very proper tripod here. This is one of those like handheld tripods that is precariously perked on top of a Xerox paper box. Anyway, there's the 30 seconds. Uh, so ITS, you're familiar with ITS. ITS 1 and 2, we generally refer to the entire ITS region. So this whole region here, uh, if you hear somebody say ITS, that's usually what they mean. So that is ITS. So what they're actually referring to is ITS 1 dash 5.8S, which is uh, part of the ribosomal DNA, and ITS 2. So if they just say ITS, that's what they mean. They mean this whole region. There are reasons why we want to do that. Real quick, the conserved region. So see this word here? Conserved, 5.8S is conserved. It is part of the ribosomal DNA machinery. Uh, and that's, again, in a whole other topic. But you can see here in the box, I think it was supposed to be gray. That is the conserved region. So we can kind of peg uh, what, what does conserve mean? Conserve means it doesn't change very often. So if you have a group of individual, even at the species or genus level, very likely this 5.8S will be identical. So that doesn't help us with things like strains or cultigens. So we often ignore this region, not simply because we not just want to ignore it, but it's not informative. So there's another word that is not on this slide uh, that you may hear. We say it's not should have wrote that first. Not informative. The 5.8S region is conserved. It's not informative, i.e. another thing they say is it doesn't have any signal. So there's no signal, phylogenetic signal. So signal is just like, you know, in conventional terms, it means there's nothing there really. There's just like, it's like, it, it's just no signal. It's not that it's not there. It's not white noise or anything. It's just there's nothing to be gained there. Because we what, what we want to do is we want to look at these regions. So these regions, as it says here, are what we call variable. So ITS1, ITS2. These are what are called variable regions. So they have phylogenetic signal um, and they are going to evolve. Uh, they're going to mutate and they are going to, not only that, they're not under any uh, constraints, right? So the great thing about the ITS-1 and ITS-2 is uh, if you look at the real name, it's called the internally transcribed spacer. 
Okay, so internally transcribed, again, if you go back to the central dogma, transcription is the process where essentially RNA gets turned uh, into proteins. Uh, I should say that's translation, I said that wrong. <laughs> uh, so there's this process of what's called uh, transcription, which is DNA to RNA, and then there's translation, which is RNA to protein. Uh, and again, that, that's kind of, in this case, synonymous because if it's internally transcribed, it never makes it into a protein. So it's not transcribed, it's not translated, and it's essentially just free to do whatever the beep it wants. And so that means that we can use the ITS. Here's where it comes uh, to us in the fingerprinting and the barcoding uh, kind of the utilitarian way is that we can use that highly variable region, or I shouldn't say highly variable, variable region to identify species. Okay, species are okay. Species and populations, if you get a bunch uh, of oyster mushrooms and you sequence all their ITS uh, regions, and, and again, that kind of in, in kind of includes the 5.8s. We we don't say that. Um, so when we say ITS uh, in colloquial terms, <laughs> if that is a colloquial term, we mean the whole thing. So this comes back to the reasons for again. I want to get into about alignment. So you can sort of peg this. This would be like you know a thumbtack on your little DNA sequences. When you don't really know, maybe down here it's a little bit sketchy, a little bit over here it's kind of sketchy, you can peg this 5.8S region in the middle. Um, and that allows you and your computer programs to basically align the other sides. So then if you want to look at species and identify a species, you look at the whole thing. All right. And that's only about, I don't know, by six to 800 base pairs, depending on the species. Again, sometimes you have to kind of chop off the ends here because of technical problems and human error, maybe. Um, so you'll end up with, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight hundred bases. And for most species, that's enough. That's where the problems start. We mostly in the cube community are dealing with strains, cultigens, varieties, isolates, hybrids, whatever the hell you want to call them. ITS, I hate to say it, and I hate to like hurt anybody feeling, <laughs> hurt anybody's feelings. ITS is useless below species. Okay, so even oyster mushrooms like the Centrino pileatus and the Cornucopioides complexes, um, they they are very very difficult to separate, even based on ITS. Morphologically, they look very different, just like our white and brown and big and small and weird cubes. Uh, ITS doesn't help you out. Sorry, guys. ITS sequencing is really, um, to be honest at this point, pretty straightforward and everything that you would be interested in is already sequenced and on GenBank. And I hate to say it, but if you want to get to species or population levels or isolates or cultivars, or you want to confirm that you've made a, a successful mating, i.e. like a cross, and you've got a dicarion and you want to know uh, what the parental types were. Maybe you did a, a double swab technique. Maybe you did some of the fancier stuff like monocarrying crosses. Um, the only way to verify that is either with uh, two, two things that are so different that it would be obvious um, that the ITS sequences would be sort of a, they call it a chimera or sort of like a, a mix of the two um, uh, parental sequences, or you go to other techniques that are um, that I've talked about on some of my my Facebook posts, like SSRs, RFLPs, ISSRs. Um, the list goes on and on, but those are those are techniques that are more in line with the fingerprinting that the police would use for criminals or paternity tests. So if you get convicted of a felony, uh, you're going to get your DNA put into a database. That's like the old traditional fingerprints, you know, that they used to use uh, back in the, in the, in the day. Uh, fingerprinting uh, using techniques like SSR, um, tandem repeats. I think that the crime people have a, another acronym for it. Something like sim tandem simple repeats, TSR or something like that. The whole idea is that not, you're not really, okay, so when you get to fingerprinting, un unfortunately, ITS has become uh, known, kind of corrupted word as the, the fingerprint of the fungal community. That was for two reasons. People decided it uh, in a meeting, I believe it was in 2010. And um, it's also just a very common term. Everybody knows what a fingerprint is. So now if you're doing like I am now and you start talking about ITS-1 and internally transcribed things and translation and transcription, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you throw other words in here like introns, exons, and whatnot, but we won't go there. So I'm already at uh, 10 minutes. Barcoding again, barcoding, you guys, if you ever worked in a grocery store like I used to, uh, universal product code, that's what. Uh, so nobody really calls them, um, you know, 
UPCs anymore unless you work in the retail industry. We call them barcodes, the scanner, right? When you go up to the little scanner, even now we have them. stuff that are a little bit fancier than they were back in the day. Um, you know, just kind of like our modern QR codes. So here's the problem. Um, well, I don't want to get into it now. We're at 10 minutes already, you guys. Um, please, like, um, try to send me some questions. You guys can find me the same name if you just search for me on uh, Facebook or, or get, in, in, get in contact with Mike Ogeeky and maybe shoot him some questions. Um, I, I, again, I've I'm, I'm been doing this for many, many years, so I don't, I don't really know where to start, to be honest. Um, in fact, I mean, I could go on for probably three hours about that little part of this diagram. Uh, so I, I don't really want to inundate people with things and, and fancy words, which is probably what I've done already. Um, anyway, I will hopefully I'll see y'all, um, uh, uh, I don't know, somewhere online, I reckon. <laughs> Unless you're coming here, man, you're welcome to visit. It's a fun place. Anyway, I'll talk to y'all later. Bye-bye. Have a good day.